Your strength is made perfect when we can get out of the way. So I just ask this morning a simple prayer. Father, would you teach us something new? Would you guide us in a new way? Would you maybe help some scales fall from our eyes? Whatever we may need this morning, would we understand that you are the perfect provision? I thank you, God, so much for every person in this room that, uh, gosh, even if I've never met them, I truly believe they're brothers and sisters if they are in Christ and we are going to celebrate in heaven for all of eternity one day. And while we're not going to have a church affiliation up there, I genuinely believe I'm going to be able to recognize my brothers and sisters and be like, we did this together down there. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Father, fill us up this morning. We love you. We trust you. And in Jesus' name, now you have your opportunity. We all sang, amen. Come on now. Everybody now. I feel like I'll say that if I preach until I'm 80, I don't know if that's going to happen. I might, who knows? Uh, I will never stop saying this. You all know church should be fun, right? I'm, man, I just am over us walking in and think we got to look like zombies for two hours and then go home. That is not what the kingdom of heaven is like. So I will get up here and embarrass myself and sing in high-pitched voices until somebody else starts doing it with me. <clears throat> All right. So let's read 1 Peter 5. Uh, it'll be up on the screens for you. Again, I would encourage you to have it in your own Bibles. Y'all got to be reading that thing for yourself. You really, really do, but I'm going to read it to you. Starting in verse 1, to the elders among you. I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Now he's talking to our elders. He's talking to, and we'll, we'll get there, our wise, our mature individuals. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be. Not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but belong, or, or but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, I love that. Jeff always says this, uh, any leader in the kingdom of God is simply an under-shepherd. Take that one with you, because what's this say? When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, somebody, listen to me over here, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Oof. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know the family of believers throughout the world. Have we, do we just prayed for this, guys. We're living this out real time. Isn't that cool to think about? You know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kinds of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you. Oh, my goodness. Doesn't it make you feel good you don't have to restore yourself? Does that encourage anybody? You came in feeling a little weary. You came in feeling a little tired. You came in a little frustrated. You got some family issues. You got this problem, that problem, X other problem. This doesn't say that you have to restore yourself. It says he himself will restore you. Amen. Mm. And he'll make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. We're going to stop there. He's got some final greetings. Please feel free to read those for yourself. But we'll stop at verse 11. As, as we looked at this chunk of scripture, <clears throat> it kind of seems like there's a lot going on and that maybe it even jumps around a little bit. I tend to, when I'm teaching a, a scripture, I, I really pray and I'm like, all right, God, what, what in here are you trying to pull out for, for the body? Um, and I f saw like 40 things. I was like, oh boy, okay, there's a lot of options here. And as I looked at it, and, I, and we're talking about suffering and standing firm and trusting God in hard times, and we got in a, in a meeting on Thursday, and we're talking through the passage, we felt pretty unified that there was a specific message uh, that was clear and was for us as a body, and it comes from verses 5 through 7 specifically, 5 through 7. Heather, if you want to try to throw that up, I don't have a slide for it, but I'll read it to you. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. 
I'm going to pause there really quick. Pause real, really quick. Uh, when we were looking at First Peter like months ago, deciding if this is where we wanted to go, uh, I was reading through it. And I was like, I actually asked to teach this passage. Now, God, the reason being, because I'm a little on the younger side. So I was like, I think I do this well. And I want my young people to hear me this morning. Hallelujah. All right. I did not know that God's sense of humor was going to line this up on the same weekend as the lock-in. Okay. And that's how God works. So I volunteered for this passage like eight weeks ago, not realizing that God, he's not a jerk, but it felt like it. Okay. So it says, young, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. That's a reference of Proverbs 3. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Here's why I love this. I think these three verses address Two, two things specifically that popped to mind to me. One, they address many of the major problems in the world. Like I look at three verses here and God is speaking to what this culture has a lot of or a lack of. And then the second thing I think it does is that it pushes us towards a multi-generational church grounded in humility. And we're gonna get deep into that part specifically. So first, it addresses such obvious apparent problems. It brings up tendencies for younger people to struggle submitting to older people. Anybody want to say amen? Amen. Don't be too loud, bro. It's like you serve in youth ministry or something. It addresses a a struggle or a, a tendency for young people to struggle to submit to older people. It addresses our often lack of humility and tendency, tendencies towards pride. It even brings up anxiety. It, it implies that many of us probably have it and we should cast it. Don't hold on to it, cast it. It talks about these things and all of these problems that are potentially more relevant today than they even were when this book was written 2,000 something years ago. And yet that meant these were all problems then too. You know that people don't really change. I would argue people can't change. There's only one person who can help you change. If we've had the same problem for 2,000 years, you better stop reading self-help books because then 2,000 years from now, we're going to be the same again. But I don't think the emphasis is just what's wrong with us. That's not the point here. Like, y'all got so many problems. Sheesh. No. I think it's implying that when these things are, are, are present, when these things are active, when we're not humble, when we're struggling with anxiety, when we aren't unified, when we aren't submitting to each other, these types of things, we will struggle to stand firm. So the entire point of this series. And, and that's why I bring the second reason that I love this section because it's, it gets to the problems, it gets to some of the things that we need more of or less of, <clears throat> but it starts with the need for young to submit to elders. And for all of us to clothe ourselves in humility towards one another. So here's the point that I'm going to spend. Y'all, I am a three-point message type of boy. I don't have three points, so you know the Lord's moving, okay? I only got two. Oh, I gotta, sorry, Heather, you did exactly what I asked you to do, so you did a great job. The church stands firm with every generation working together in humility. The church, us, stand firm with every generation working together in humility. Now, if I say that, and you're like, well, Phil, that's a pretty basic point. In about 10 minutes, you'll understand why I don't think it's that basic. And I don't think we do it well. And I think if we did do it well, it would look a lot different. I also think it's why grace is in this really encouraging new season, because we are meshing new generations in ways a lot of churches are not. That's not a comparative thing. We are who God is calling us to be, but we're taking the steps. I'll give you an example. We uh, were in a meeting in Jeff shared an example, no names needed, any of that stuff, but he was sitting in a pastor's meeting from the region. And I don't remember what he said, but a dozen to 30, I forget if he said 30, I can't remember. I might be making that number up. There's a lot of other pastors in the room and they were talking about how do we engage the next generation? It feels like we're losing him. And Grace Fellowship Church was the only church in the room that had someone on staff under the age of 40. Only church, only one. No, none of them had young people on staff. And they were struggling to grow. They're struggling to bring people in. They're struggling to have thriving youth communities. And I just need you to hear whether you're 844 in the room or you're seven years old. Grace Fellowship Church has a thriving youth community. 
The church stands firm firm with every generation working together in humility. So let's talk about this. It's just so interesting that directly after in the first four verses, it challenges elders. I do love that because it always starts with the wise, mature ones. The challenge is first on the wise and mature ones. Now, the word elder in this passage uh, is interesting because we talked a lot about this as pastors and kind of broke this down. It is alluding to a position in a church, but also the word itself as used in Greek is effectively defined as this, a wise and mature older believer who's qualified for leaderships due to their behavior, qualified for leadership due to their actions. Now, you might not be an elder of a church in this room. There's a handful of our elders in the room right now. But if you qualify, if you're wise and mature, you're, you're following the Lord, then you actually match that description in some ways. So that's for a lot of us, whether or not we realize it. He starts challenging the elders. He says, you got to lead a certain way. you got to live a certain way. Uh, those that are wise and experienced and mature, it looks like this. But then he directs to younger people and says that we should submit to those people. Me. I should submit to those people. Here's why it's interesting, because it's almost as if God knew young people would be bad at this. And we are. We are bad at this. We are bad at this. How many of you, uh, and let's not get too rowdy, okay? How many of you have experienced disrespectful young people? Come on, calm down. How did I know? And then when I challenge y'all later, you're going to be silent. But I bring that up and y'all go, okay. How about this? How many of you were the disrespectful young person? Yeah, they're my people right there. Me too, amen. Hallelujah for redemption. <laughs> Friends, I could vent for like 30 hours straight about disrespectful young people. Oh man, we, we've been in a season in, in Awaken in the youth ministry where we're just growing like crazy and God is bringing them in, like we're fulfilling the vision. I mean, we're having, there are weeks where we have 10 new kids in a single week. I mean, they are just coming in. We're in the middle of sports seasons and still have 150 kids coming every single week. But with that growth or what I've been to defining with my leadership team as growing pains, It's harder to rally that many kids. It's harder to corral that many kids. It is truly like herding kittens sometimes. All right, my wife just made us get chickens. All six of them got out the second day that we had them. I felt like that was youth ministry. (laughs) Just grabbing them aggressively and chucking them back where they're supposed to be. We have never done that disclaimer. (laughs) Or at least we wouldn't admit it. (laughs) <laughs> but, but I'll be frank, we've dealt with a lot of arrogant young people. We've dealt with difficult young people. We've dealt with young people who come in and they have no idea what church is supposed to be and they kind of just do whatever the heck they want and Phil, frankly, at times has been stressed out and the God has redeemed it every single time, amen. But we've dealt with disrespectful young people and the truth is this, we have a culture of young people for the most part that often don't respect the older generation. We can be rude, we can be arrogant, we can be prideful, we truly think that we know absolutely everything due to access on the internet. We feel like we have it all figured out and we know the best for everything when the reality is we know little to nothing about anything. I like that I can say we because I know I'll be like this sometimes. But you know what's so cool is we're reading this passage and God knew it was going to be this way. It's almost like he made it all. It's almost like he knows better than us. In fact, guess what? The internet didn't exist 2,000 years ago, and these letters are still being written saying the same things. So, hey, for my older family, maybe before we blame it on the culture, we just understand it's ingrained in us. So they were dealing with the same issues back here. Why would he talk about young people submitting to their elders if they probably weren't? And God's challenge for myself and my other younger people in the room and watching online is that God's intention and design is that we humbly learn from people wiser than you. It's his design that we, excuse me, shut up and listen a little bit more. One thing I don't like about my generation and the generation after me is that 
even if we're not the most vocal individual, you can be, oh, you can be an opinionated introvert. Anybody say amen? Oh, you might not say a lot of words, but you got a lot of thoughts up in that head of yours. And whether you say it out loud or not, we talk too much. We don't listen nearly enough. I want to suggest that if you don't do that, if you're in the room and it's hard for you to submit, and again, you could be 50 and be struggling to submit to a 70-year-old, that could be whatever it might look like. If we struggle with that and you think you know everything and we think older people are lame and they're disconnected because they don't know how to use an iPhone or whatever it might be, you actually probably will miss growing in the way God wants you to as a young person. If you go through your young life and you don't listen to older people, you don't submit to wiser people, you don't uh, hear the experiences of older people, you will not grow and mature the way you are meant to. So young people, I need you to hear me. And again, you can, girl, you, you define young for yourself, okay? So if you want me to be talking to you right now, you be talked to, all right? But my young people in the room, some of you are really deciding if this is for you or not right now. <laughs> Should I listen? Should I wait for the older person part? I don't know. I'll let you decide. My young people, I need you to hear me. Back in biblical times, young people actually aimed to be what was called the white-haired elder at the gate. Like, it was desired to grow to be mature and wise. Can I tell you, nowadays, we, like, act like age is a bad thing. Well, I got wrinkles, so I need Botox. Well, I'm not going to be as relevant as I get older, whatever it might be. Well, I don't know. I don't want to be disconnected. I don't want this, that, and the other. And yet, back then, Hebrew boys wanted to be the white-haired elder at the gate. Why? Because those were the wise ones who had something to offer. Those were the ones who had experience, and you could talk to them and be like, oh, my goodness, you've really been through it. I have so much to learn. We've lost that culture as young people. What would it look like to rebuild it? What would it look like to be rebuild being the young people that actually seek wisdom out, realizing we probably don't understand yet? Crazy thing, too, is that your prefrontal cortex, this is my biology nerd coming back. If you don't know, I have a biochemistry degree. Your boy did not go to seminary. Okay, but I love the word of God and I got Holy Spirit. All right, so don't email me later. But I got a biochemistry degree and your prefrontal cortex, which is your decision-making lobe, doesn't even fully like form till you're like 25 to 30. Meaning that means I'm old and it just about finished. Okay, so I'm done so. You know what I mean? That means when you're young, you will feel so strongly opinionated about something and two years later think something completely different. That's just biology, okay? You can't even can't talk to me about that. So friends, my younger people, this needs to be our goal. Go to older people and learn. They have a wealth of life experience and it's at your fingertips, but we're going to social media with our fingertips instead. Man, we spend so much time scrolling people's opinions and looking through TikTok and getting our information from 14 second videos when you could sit for an hour with someone who's done it for 60 years. You see the difference? See the difference, my young people? This is important. This is really, really important. Now, I do want to briefly touch on the other side of the coin, okay? So my, uh, again, however, you've self-defined in the room. For my younger people, uh, maybe you're like, well, Phil, you really came to get after us. I did. Now let's flip the coin. Dang. Doo -doo -doo. That didn't sound like a coin at all. <laughs> this says, for young people, this is so huge. I need somebody to lean in for this. Submit to your elders. We just defined elder as wise and mature. We just define elder as wise and mature, qualified for leadership. Now, it's interesting because the commentary I was reading broke down the word, the word elder here, and it, it kind of worded it that way. So this is not telling young people to just submit to someone because they're older than you. That's not what it's telling people. Now, we could get into, like, we are called to honor and respect and those things, but this passage is saying submit to your elders, and elder is defined a certain way, i.e., just because you're older or in a position of authority or a guardian over someone hmm, does not mean that biblically that young person should do what you say. We'll talk about this for a second. I want to be clear. The Bible also does demand things like love and respect, honor your mother and father as if onto the Lord, these types of things. But maybe this sums up what I think I'm trying to say, and this came from our pastor's meeting. Respect should be freely given, but trust is earned. 
If you are an elder or an older individual, but not operating the way this passage suggests, if you aren't wise, you aren't mature. Hey, friends, there are a lot of 50-year-olds that are still little boys inside. Mm. There are a lot of 44-year-old women that you, you still acting like a 16-year-old. Oh, I say it in love, but that don't change that it's true. If you are older, this passage suggests if you aren't these things, you aren't godly, you aren't qualified for leadership, and yet you expect the younger generation to listen to you and do what you say, let me ask you a question. Should a young person be submitting to you? Oh, I'm gonna use a word right here. Is the way you're living worth them submitting to? You know how many people I think get older and think their voice should just be heard because it's their voice and I've been around for a while, but your life will dictate whether or not people should listen to you. A lot of us in the room, and I'm not faulting anybody because this is gonna happen to me too. I'm, gosh, I'm just envisioning when Evie's 16 and I'm acting a fool and then Evie listens to nothing I say and I hope I'm wise enough to realize she shouldn't be listening to me in this area. Is that fair? So I wanna challenge some of us in the room. We've been really, really frustrated that young people aren't listening to us. That could be a kid. That could be people you've tried to invest in. That could be you're a teacher and blah, 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 blah. But they see the way you're acting. They decide pretty quickly if they wanna listen to what you have to say. Now let me ask, your end, my end, our end, is that we gotta do behind the scenes what we have to do first. And allow them or how about this, allow us to be someone worth submitting to. My parents, this is something I'm not convinced I do well, but it's worth saying. You have to live and parent in a way that they want to submit to you, that, that you're worth submitting to. They can honor you, that's great. They, they biblically have to do that. But if you are all over the, you know how many students we have come and their parents are at the bar while they're here? I hate that junk. Don't ask them to act the way you're not. That's garbage. That's garbage. And that's a hard word, but I hope you hear it in love. Let me shift this here, my elders in the room, my mature, my wise individuals, my godly men and women who are in lead or are leaders in different avenue. Uh, we just have to ask ourselves these questions today, yesterday, and forever. Have we earned a young person's submission? Are we being a voice that they should actually listen to? Are we even trying to invest? It's just crazy to me sometimes that I watch uh, as older generations, and I'm tempted to do this sometimes, just bash the younger generation. Well, they're so lazy. They're so entitled. They can't get off their phones. There's no work ethic. They're so sensitive and triggered. And the funny thing is, as I said a bunch of those, a bunch of you probably agreed with a bunch of them. I'm gonna submit two things to you, brothers and sisters. The first thing is this, you raised that generation. Can I be frank, youth ministry this year has been easily the hardest since I've been leading, and I've been leading pushing a decade now. We're growing like crazy, the kids are difficult, attitudes are hard, some are down there disrespectful like we talked about, and as I'm dealing with difficult kids, I'm chasing kids into the parking lot, I'm pulling kids aside to have one-on-one -on -one conversations multiple times a night. Can I tell you something? I'm not upset with them, I'm upset with their parents. I don't look at this generation and think, man, you guys are just missing it. I'm like, who raised them? What are they going home to? Fifteen-year-old doesn't know any better. They just were never taught. I think the reason 150-plus students flood into Awaken every week, and many of them have issues and behavioral problems and all these things, and a lot of them don't even know why they come. I'm going to tell you why they come, because they're receiving love they don't get anywhere else. Can you hear my passion for this? So they act up. And they don't do what they're supposed to do at church. Friends, we've been dealing with this. I've been walking beside leaders who I love deeply, but I'm just trying to guide them like, hey, if they show up and they don't do what they're supposed to do, one, what do you mean what we're supposed to do? Jesus didn't go to anybody and say, this is how you're supposed to act. He loved them. He loved them. You cannot clean a fish before you catch it.
But I understand the frustration. I understand that at times it's distracting and it's hard. Uh, but we have to be the intercessors. We have to be the people intervening. Us is, I'll, I'll just throw myself into the older category now. We can't complain more than we invest. We can't look down more than we love. And I'm worried that at times we've done that to the younger generation. We've complained about them more than we've invested in them. Have you invested as much as you've complained? Oh, come on, I need my wise people in the room to hear me. If you've complained more about the next generation being hopeless more than you've taught them hope, you are part of the problem. Now, let me take this time, because Phil, Phil just went on a soapbox of being challenging. Let me lift up and honor uh, and highlight my parents, my leaders, my mentors in the room that have raised their families intentionally, that have mentored young people even when it's hard, that have kept showing up even when the kid disrespected them, kept showing up even when the kid didn't want it, kept showing up when the kid frankly maybe even told you that I'm done with it, that you lead groups to love the next generation, hear me, thank you. You've done kingdom work. If you are a parent in this room that not perfectly, but had worked hard to introduce your kids to Jesus, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. I would encourage you to find other parents and teach them to do it too. You're a part of building the future. You're modeling what Peter says here of being an elder that doesn't shepherd because they must, but because they're willing, you in the room that fill that are worthy of being honored. Thank you for your diligence and commitment to the next generation. So for both parties now, the younger, the older, and the everywhere in between, again, if you're kind of like, well, I fit in the middle, feel cool. Look at verse six, look at verse six. How do we do this? Well, Phil, I'm hearing your challenge. I'm a younger person, and, and at times it's harder for me. It's hard for me to submit to older people. And, and well, these people, I don't know that they've really earned my submission, but maybe I need to get better at honoring them anyways. And maybe for an older person, you're realizing I've posted on Facebook about how the young generation's lazy and I've done nothing to love any of them. And maybe you're in the room or hearing my voice and you're convicted that you haven't done this well. That could be with a kid, that could be with whoever. Hey, grace on you, you can be better today. You can start today. That's okay. God knew we would fail. That was almost part of the expectation. That's why he sent Jesus. But for both parties, how do we do this? I just love it. Verse six, humble yourselves, therefore, under, the, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Whether you think they're the problem or you think they're the problem or you don't really know and you don't really care, this points right back to who? Ourselves. Oh, cool. You, you want to stand firm? You want to build a multi-generational church? You want to love other people? You know where it starts? Humble yourself. Oh, I know you think they got a lot of problems. Humble yourself. Well, they've done the things wrong and they, well, humble yourself. You know, the best way to impact someone who's done a lot of bad things, humble yourself. Because when you do, you're going to love them better. You want to know our frustration? with young people, our frustration with old people, our frustration with difficult people, we're being prideful. So family, I think the call is clear for all of us here, my young people in the room, submit to the wise, submit to the mature, submit to your elders, learn and grow. Older, mature, wiser people, my elders in the room, humbly love the next generation. Lead them in the ways of the everlasting. Submit to their giftings that they have and learn from them. I want to highlight my sister Becky, who I think is backstage. In our pre-prayer meeting this morning, she prayed, and, and we knew where we were going with this, and she prayed, God, I thank you that on this team, which our worship team is very multi-generational, she said, I thank you that I get to submit to someone half my age, and that it's so full of joy. I don't know, when's the last time you thought something like that? When's the last time you prayed something like that? So wherever you're at there, let's love humbly, humble ourselves, clothe ourselves with humility towards each other. And together, let's build the kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. I just have to do this. I can't talk about this without giving you just an example of what it looks like because we just have it here. We just have it here. I want to briefly talk and I'm going to show you something here. It's going to be really funny. Uh, 
I wanna talk about our pastoral and leadership team here, our staff here. We have everything from 23 to like 70 effectively and everywhere in between, all leading and loving this place on different levels. Uh, we have an amazing multi-generational leadership team. I'm gonna, okay. <laughs> Yesterday, I sent a text out to a bunch of our leaders asking how old they each are. Typically not a well-received text. And I was tired from the lock-in, so literally I'm just texting people, hey, yo, how old are you? That's, I swear, at least five text, uh, uh, staff members here got that exact text. Hey, yo, how old are you? So let's go through some ages. <laughs> I also didn't ask permission to do this. <laughs> I'm 30, okay? My brother Mark is 58. Chris Sissick, our Grace Cares Director, is 47. Jesse, our Worship Director, is 31. Susan and Michael Benna, our Youth and Sunday Worship uh, Worshippers and Band Directors, are 23, I think. Susan, are you 23? Okay. I didn't text you guys. Michelle, our women's director, is 51. I'm just going to put this out there. Michelle does not look 51. Good for you, girl. Good for you, girl. <laughs> Jeff, our longtime fearless leader, is 60. Tara, uh, our kids ministry director, is 44. Ben Lawrence, our amazing executive pastor, is 82. Do you guys see where I'm going with this? <laughs> I've been waiting for this part of the message for so long, Ben. Oh, Ben didn't get a text. I feel so relieved now. I needed to get that one out. <laughs> I just got to share with If you don't see how fluid and joyful the leadership here is, I hope you want leadership like that. I hope you don't want stoic, boring, like, well, we just have to go by the motions leadership. We don't do it like that. In fact, I want to prove this. Uh, I have texts from Tara Farmer when I texted her this yesterday. Um, I almost didn't ask permission. I did. It would have been funnier if I didn't. I'm going to put these up here for you. This is proof. This is legitimately. Read, read this for yourself. <laughs> Guys, this is not staged. This is exactly how this conversation went. Let's keep going. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, man. Let's keep going. <laughs> this is how we speak to each other. This is real. All right, I got one more. I can't show the whole conversation, but. <laughs> oh. Okay. There was more, but someone would have been borderline. Maybe don't show on a Sunday morning, you know what I'm saying? No, just kidding, just kidding. The church stands firm with every generation working together in humility. You see it? You hear it? Do you feel it? I love that we have this. This is the model that Peter is giving us and encouraging us to do. So here's an application. And I'm about to invite my brother up to give his, testimony, his life story, his testimony. Young people in the room, this is your application. This is your leave with this. Young people in the room, I challenge you to intentionally sit down with an older believer and just humbly ask questions and listen. Just find someone, whether you know them or not. It could be someone you already have in your life. It could be someone you've seen here at church and you're like, I kind of want to know something about you. Sit, ask questions, and learn. I encourage you to do that with at least one person this week. Older friends, I challenge you to invest in a young person. Listen to them. Learn from them. Their upraising and their culture and what they were born into is much different than yours, probably. Listen. Learn. And I promise you, you will benefit, and these will help us build the kingdom. So I'm going to introduce up my brother, Frank. Frank Fiore, I don't know where you're at, but come on, come on up here. Can we give it up for Frank really quick? <laughs> this is a brother um, that I love deeply. He's a young man. He is someone that I'm excited that he's going to share a story today uh, because he's good at this. 
He submits to wiser, mature people. Uh, he submits to me. He submits to other people in our leadership team. Uh, and he's a humble man of God. So I'm going to say for you to share your story. Take it, take it away. Good morning, Grace. Good morning. My name is Frank Fiore. I've been attending Grace for about three years, and I've been serving for two. Well, almost two. But at the end of this year, at Awaken, it'll be two. My story starts with some... I'm gonna say relatively difficult circumstances surrounding my birth. Being that it was an emergency C-section, and I'm gonna tell you why here very shortly. So while I was being brought into the world, the amniotic band wrapped around my wrist, so much so that it cut off circulation from my arm all the way up through my shoulder. It caused a blood traffic jam all the way up and down my arm, which caused my fingertips to go necrotic and die while they were still attached to me. And when they took the amniotic band off, the scar that I have on my wrist, if you can see it, um, it didn't scab over, it just closed in on itself. Now, while this was all happening, the doctors were coming to my dad and my mother and father and saying, we might have to chop his arm off. And my dad, who I love to imagine being like 5'3", because he's just like shorter than me, and the doctor being 6'1", picks the doctor up by his shirt collar, says, you're not touching my son, and sets him down. I just love that imagery of a short man picking up the taller one. But with that, with that, and he asked the doctors to wait. And for three months, they waited and prayed and fasted. And they waited and waited and waited. And finally, my shoulder started to pink up. And then color returned to my entire arm, except my fingertips, which fell off as I was growing. So praise God that I have this arm attached to me today. Now, you would think with a testimony such as that, already I would have an unshakable faith in God. That was not so. Not so. As I was being brought up, my parents, though they were doing it very, you know, in their own way and doing it the best that they could, the example that they provided was not, not all that stellar. My dad instilled in me very heavily, very heavily, that I needed to take care of my sisters coming from a broken home himself where his own father just left the family, left his mother to raise him and his sister by themselves, and he suffered many an abuse and many of that. And in his mind, he said, I'm not going to put my kids through that same abuse. I'm going to be better. My mom, unfortunately, did not have the same mentality and took the sins that her parents committed in their parenting and brought it into the household, which caused me to have several questions. My dad told me very, when I was very young, you got to protect and you got to look after your sisters. You got to take care of them because I'm not going to be here forever and you got to be that person. And my mom would routinely, verbally, and mentally abuse them. And so the main question that I would have as I was growing up was how is somebody supposed to protect them from their own mother? How, is, how am I supposed to do that? And so dealing with that inadequacy rising up in my mind, hanging over my head like a storm cloud that just would not go away, I medicated. I ran around with the people I shouldn't. I smoked weed. I vaped very heavily. I tried to run away from it. I mean, while I was still going to youth group and I would even have experiences, deep spiritual experiences, let me go into one right here. On a youth retreat to a place in Long Beach Island called Harvey Cedars, God has just incredibly blessed that place. I had a spiritual experience that was just absolutely incredible. It was the last message on the last day of the night, and if you've ever been to a youth retreat, you know that's when God decides that he's going to move the hardest. And so the message being preached was casting stuff onto God and giving it up for him. And we were going to demonstrate it out by having a rock in our hand and chucking it into the bay. I already knew what mine was. The rock was control. It was control over my life, control over my worth, control over how I viewed myself. And I waited for everybody else to go on the pier because I knew it was going to take me a minute. And I walk out on that pier and I'm holding that rock so desperately in my hand because this is the only thing that I had been raised to believe, raised to accept in myself. And I was holding it so tightly that I could have drawn blood out of my palm. That's how tightly I was holding on to this thing. My youth pastor and several other people came and surrounded me and wisely said, Frank, you got to let it go. 
you got to let it go. you got to let it go. And as it's rolling and tumbling around in my head, I let the rock go. It drops, and all the strength in my body leaves, and I collapse right there on the pier. And as I was being carried into the room, all of the anguish and pain of that loss left my body, and I received a joy that caused me to get up and start dancing around the room we were at. You'd think something like that would change me, right? That I would walk away and just be full of the spirit and full of just everything. No. Sadly, that wasn't the case. I still rode around with the same people. I still did drugs. I still smoked weed. I still drank. I still did all of those things because I didn't really understand who was manipulating this whole entire life story up until this point. I got into a car accident via riding around with the wrong people. He was driving in a way that he wasn't supposed to, and I was just like, hey, we're having fun. We're drifting around on a narrow road with trees surrounding either side. Yeah, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. No, we ended up getting into a car crash that caused me to have two cracked ribs, a collapsed and punctured lung, a lacerated liver, and a broken T1 vertebra right here on my neck that if it broke anywhere else but the wing, I would have been paralyzed from the head down. And by the grace of God, I'm still here and I'm still walking. And still even with that, and still even with that, I was just running away from him with everything that I had. Because that same mentality of being inadequate was rolling around in my head and I'm like, how can I go to somebody who has unending love and unending grace when I am just, I am so terrible. I am so imperfect. I am just, I'm worthless, and yet he's still deciding to come down to me. I can't go to that right now. I need to clean myself up. So I went, and I started working, and I started, you know, doing what I could to try to make a life worthy of being a Christian. And that's when it happened. The job that I was working at began to fall apart. It fell apart to the point where I had to drop out of college to continue working, to continue supporting myself. And in the midst of all of that turmoil, the same abuse that I had mentioned to my, about my mother caused my dad to serve her divorce papers. So as an 18-year-old man in a job that I was working very hard to maintain, having to drop out of college and now having my own family falling apart right in front of me, I couldn't take it. I could not take it. One fateful day, I was driving home after a long shift. I worked like 16 hours at a fast food restaurant. And I'm driving down the road. And I'm listening to some like really heavy alternative rock. It's just, it's sad. It's, it's everything under the book. And I was like, I don't even know what caused me to do this. But I just, I cried out and I'm like, God, I don't want to be here. Everything that I have tried to build here is falling apart in front of me. And if I can't do this, I don't know what my purpose is. So I'm going to slam my car into the median of this highway as fast as I can in the hopes that I get to see you in the next five minutes. And in that moment, I'm sobbing, I'm getting ready to hit the accelerator. God changes the song on my phone to a song called Only Jesus by Casting Crowns. And if any of you know it, the song talks about how Everything you build here on earth is worthless. The only name, it's not even my own name that matters. It's the name of Jesus that does. And it was almost like God was just twisting my soul to realize why he had been letting me go through what he had been letting me go through. It was for me to come to the realization that what I build doesn't matter. How I am doesn't matter. What my name means doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is if through me people understand him first. And then after that amazing revelation, I called up my youth pastor at like three in the morning. And I'm like, hey, I don't know what this next step of faith is, but I'm ready. And he goes, okay, cool. I'll see you at Panera at 2 p.m. So I drive there at 2 p.m. and he's like mentoring me and giving me wise counsel. And he always left me with this one little thing I'm going to give to all you young people here. To be loved, you must first be known. That means if you have a problem or you're struggling with something in the life, put it at the feet of somebody wiser and see what they have to say about it. 
And so me doing that with him for months and months and months, one day out of nowhere, he just goes, I want you to go ask Phil Cook if, for a leadership position at Awaken. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what, me? You, you want me to, but I have this big old list of things that I got to like, I got to get rid of. I got to get right. And he looks at me and he says, name one person in the Bible that was called to service who was ready. And I couldn't. And so with that, I'm here at Awaken, and I'm serving. And even with all that and that new commitment, the weight still is there. The inadequacy is there. In fact, quite recently, what the devil has been attempting to do to get me to go back to my old ways, I've had several significant relationships end consecutively over the past couple months. A breakup, the loss of both my grandparents on my mother's side, the loss of several family friends, and with that, all, all of that anguish just tossing around in my soul and spirit, mind and body, I was begging God to take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through this. You said that I would have blessings once I committed my life to you. What kind of blessing is this? And he gave me this, which Phil expanded upon once I met him at one of the meetings. Why would you get out of the water if you're going to get wet again? and you're supposed to bathe in my grace while doing so. And I've come to understand that that is meaning I'm supposed to feel the full depths of my grief and my emotions, while at the same time giving myself grace for when I slip up during that time. And with all of that, and with all of this here, listening to the wise people instilling in me values that I actively try to walk out, I can be a person that can stand here and stand firm and say to the storms of life around me, do your worst because my God already did his and he won. Thank you for being patient while I have been only been able to share a part of this work in progress story. Brother, love you. Yeah, you can clap for that. You can clap for that. I just want to be clear because that's my brother right there. First time he asked me about leading, I said no. <laughs> I was like, I don't think you're quite there yet. Uh, but to watch him grow has been amazing. So here's what we're going to close with. Here's where we're going to end this. I think we talk about this idea of multi-generational ministry, the importance of it, what it looks like for us uh, and the individual things. And we just see at the end of this passage, I think it does this in verses 8 through 11. It talks about the potential fruit of what would happen if we lived this way. It says, be alert and of, of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same sufferings and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory after you've suffered for a little while will himself restore you and make you strong firm and steadfast to him be the power uh, the truth that we're closing with is simply this the fruit of faith thrives in fellowship. This is all over scripture and we have to do it together. Hebrews 10 instructs, do not forsake the gathering. As some are in the habit of doing, numerous other scripture point to the necessity of unity and togetherness and the multi-generational church. But here's uh, what I want to close with and what's really cool is a multi-generational church togetherness investment is not the end goal, it's the means to the end. You want to stand firm in your faith? You want to resist the devil? You want to cast off anxiety? You want God to make you firm and steadfast and strong? Being together, working together, submitting and clothing ourselves with humility is the means to that end. And then when we do that, verse 10, after a little while, while, a little while of suffering, our time on this earth, God himself will restore us. And our togetherness is what allows us to resist, to stand firm. It aids us in all of these things. Friends, a house divided against itself cannot stand. 
But a church that is unified is the devil's worst nightmare. So I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep coming to church. I'm going to keep loving my brothers and sisters. I'm going to keep praying for humility. I'm going to keep submitting to my elders. I'm going to keep casting off anxiety in Jesus' name. I'm going to keep resisting the devil, and I'm going to do it with my church family. My question is, are you with me this morning? Good. Good. So here's how we're closing out. We're going to worship here in a second. If you want to stand firm, which I hope that you do, do it together. Do it together. Realize that you can learn from a 20-year-old. Realize you can learn from an 80-year-old. We have to do this together. Submit each other out of love. Humble ourselves under God's almighty hand and bear with one another. And when we do, we will be strong, firm, and steadfast. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that this is the truth. We thank you that this is your word. We thank you that we have a body here that has the opportunity to live this out. So, Father, I simply ask as we go into worship and we just sing your praise that you are our firm foundation, that you would help us going out today to be unified, young and old, in a way that absolutely changes the world. We love you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can stand, and we're going to worship one more time.